Hi, my name is Tim Bale and I'm Director of the Myelin Institute at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to our series of videos on the coronavirus crisis. Today we have Dr Jonathan Kennedy from the Blizzard Institute here at Queen Mary who's going to talk about what we can learn from other countries and in particular China and Italy. If you find the video useful, please do share it and do come back for more. First, I want to say a big thanks to Tim Bale and Sophia Cassano for giving me the opportunity to make this video for the Mile End Institute. For the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the UK government's response to COVID-19. It's become something of a cliche to say that the pandemic and the chaos that it's caused is unprecedented. Certainly, when we look at the speed and the scale at which COVID-19 has disrupted and threatened our lives. It's really remarkable and there's no parallel in the modern era. And yet, if we look at other countries, um, other countries like China and Italy that experienced the virus before us, we can learn various lessons. And I think the main lesson that we learn from these comparisons is that fast and firm action on the part of the government is really essential to minimizing the impact of the pandemic. The Chinese state acted really decisively in mid-January when the extent of the public health threat posed by COVID-19 became clear. So they shut down movement in and out of Wuhan, the epicenter of the virus, and they also closed down 15 other cities in Hubei province. In addition to that, um, 760 million people, so that's about half the Chinese population, were told to stay at home and only leave to buy food or get medical help. At the time, many observers seemed to think that this, this response said more about the totalitarian nature of the Chinese state than it did about the public health threat posed by COVID-19. Um, the New York Times, for example, referred to Mao-style social controls. Um, but over the last few weeks, as the virus has spread to Europe, these delusions have been exploded. The situation is changing really rapidly, but I'm talking to you now on the 28th of March, and it seems like the Chinese response has been really very successful. So it's brought down the number of new cases each day from several thousand to barely any at all. The World Health Organization, the WHO, has come out and congratulated China for its response and for turning the situation around and reversing the escalating cases. It's really quite ironic that um, early last week, on the same day as the UK was enforcing its restrictions on, on movement for the first time, that was when Hubei province was loosening its own restrictions. So the Chinese case shows us really that speed is of the essence. China brought in its restrictions on movement after about 30 people had died from COVID-19. If we compare this to Italy, um, the difference is quite remarkable. Italy started its full national lockdown after 800 people had died from the virus. And this is probably the most important factor explaining why the virus has caused so much devastation and so much human suffering in Italy. The UK lockdown came after 335 deaths from COVID. So it's somewhere in between China and Italy, but we shouldn't overlook the fact that the UK had the benefit of seeing the impact of Chinese action on the one hand and Italian inaction on the other hand. So Prime Minister Boris Johnson claims to be following the latest scientific advice and certainly the tone of the government have changed. Until he became ill at his daily press conferences, Johnson was flanked by Sir Patrick Vallance and Professor Chris Whitty. Certainly no one in this government is saying that people have had enough of experts now, as Michael Gove did in 2016. Nevertheless, the government has been really lackadaisical in its response, and it's been criticised by various high-profile doctors, public health specialists, epidemiologists, for going far too slowly. And we can see this with shutting down mass gatherings like sporting events, shutting down pubs and restaurants, shutting down schools, we can also see it when they, first of all, ask people to minimise socialising and stay at home um, rather than ordering them to do so. And we, it's still apparent that the, the restrictions in the UK are much less stringent than most of the rest of Europe and certainly China. It's interesting to consider why 
when the government claimed to be following scientific advice, is their response so slow? In order to understand this, we have to look at the way in which the government interprets scientific advice through their own ideological prism. There's been a few quotes that have come from Boris Johnson and his ministers over the last few weeks that have been really quite revealing in this respect. So at the beginning of last week, um, so almost two weeks ago, when Boris Johnson was asked if he'd used the full force of the state to stop people moving about and to stop people socialising, he said that he didn't think this would be necessary because the UK is a mature, grown-up, liberal democracy. Also last week when Michael Gove was on the Today programme justifying the, the um, change in government policy when the, Boris Johnson first ordered people to stay at home, he said that uh, this was particularly difficult for the UK because the UK is a land of liberty. I think we can take a couple of really interesting things from these statements. First of all, and unsurprisingly, Johnson and Gove's references to liberty reflect a jingoistic belief in British exceptionalism. So the idea that the British are inherently different and better than other people. They seem to imply that it's fine for foreigners. So foreigners, people in China, people in Italy, to have their rights curtailed in order to halt the spread of coronavirus. But they seem to suggest that such, such interventions are really hard for freeborn Englishmen and freeborn English women to take, to tolerate. Hubris like this has, has impressed enough people to win a referendum in 2016 and to win an election last year. But unfortunately, viruses don't pay heed to such delusions. The second related point is that it reveals just how squeamish this government are about state intervention in the private lives of individuals. For this government, it seems to be a fate that's almost worse than death, or at least the avoidable deaths of tens of thousands of older people from this virus. But Boris Johnson is a man who's made a career first as a journalist, then as a politician out of lampooning European bureaucrats. If we look even last summer when he was discussing so-called sin taxes on salty, fatty, sugary foods. So this is another major public health crisis that is facing the UK. Boris Johnson declared war on the creep of the nanny state. It's interesting to note that even, even by the standards of liberal political philosophy, Johnson and Gove's outlook is particularly unnuanced and callous. So liberal political philosophy is obviously built on the premise that humans are fundamentally individualistic and self-interested, but that the sum of these individual selfish actions will usually benefit the whole of society. Over the last few weeks, we've seen quite a few people acting selfishly. So mainly young, fit individuals have been flouting government advice and government regulations to socialise and to move about. And this is interesting because although they're very capable of passing on the virus, they're much less likely to become seriously ill and die from it. So far from having a positive effect, the sum of these individual selfish actions have actually hastened the spread of the disease and increased the possibility that the NHS will become overwhelmed with, with cases. In such situations, more nuanced, more compassionate liberal thinkers have acknowledged that state intervention is justified. Let's take John Stuart Mills, for example, in On Liberty, he, he said that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So this, this situation clearly fits the bill. So I think although the UK government's response to COVID-19 has been hobbled by a overly simplistic interpretation of liberalism, the irony is that the impact of these policy failures are being mitigated by the public embracing principles such as kindness, compassion and solidarity. It's interesting to note, however, that the pandemic has really reiterated a major flaw in liberal assumptions. So although some people have acted selfishly, there are many examples of people acting altruistically. Um, health workers, carers, neighbours, shop workers and many others have worked really tirelessly and selfishly to, to help others, 
often putting themselves at risk by doing so. And we can look at the half a million volunteers who signed up to support the NHS last week as an example of this, or we can look at the two and a half thousand retired doctors, six and a half thousand retired nurses, many of whom will have pretty generous pensions who have agreed to return to work to, to help the NHS deal with this crisis. There can be no doubt that the weeks and the months ahead are going to bring challenges. As I've discussed over the last few minutes, the government hasn't done as much as they could have done to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on the British population. Nevertheless, these examples of people acting through solidarity, out of kindness and compassion, give us some reasons to be positive and optimistic. Thank you for taking the time to listen to what I have to say about the government response to COVID. Uh, goodbye.